All right, welcome and good afternoon. I see that we have plenty of folks joining our, our webinar this afternoon. We're just gonna wait a minute or two as folks join the call. If you're looking for the new legislative maps in Wisconsin webinar, you are in the right place and we will get started in just a minute. We're happy to have you today. Okay, well, welcome. It is 12.01. So thank you so much for joining our webinar, New Legislative Maps in Wisconsin, Implications for Advocates. Um, I'm just gonna start with a few housekeeping pieces today and then we'll dive right into our content this afternoon. Um, first of all, thank you so much for joining us. Um, you may not be familiar with Wisconsin Partners. Um, it is a membership-based coalition of community and civic organizations statewide, including many organizations that I will list off shortly here including the Wisconsin Primary Healthcare Association, Greater Wisconsin Agency on Aging Resources, Wisconsin Philanthropy Network, United Way, Wisconsin Council on Churches, WISCAP, AARP, Rural Wisconsin Health Cooperative, Wisconsin Counties Association, National Alliance for Mental Health Wisconsin Chapter, Feeding Wisconsin, Create Wisconsin, and finally, the Wisconsin Early Childhood Association. These organizations reflect a range of sectors, perspectives, and immediate goals, but share a commitment to collaborating for a better Wisconsin for everyone. Wisconsin Partners uses an asset-based and relational model to address root causes and find common ground in our state. This year, Wisconsin Partners is focusing efforts on democracy, civic health, and leadership, exploring the ways that all of us from different sectors, perspectives, and communities can strengthen the civic health in our state. You can learn more about Wisconsin Partners at wisconsinpartners.org. And you're probably connected to this webinar today through one of those member associations. So whatever association that you're engaged with, we certainly appreciate you being here today. My name is Rochelle Andre. I am the government relations specialist for WIPCA, which is the statewide association for federally qualified health centers in the state. And I will be pleased to facilitate today's webinar. Our objectives for today are to share information in identifying changes to legislative maps, understanding the implications for the balance of power in the state legislature, and most importantly, consider how these changes in the maps may affect how you all as advocates or um, people engaged in the civic health process may want to talk with policymakers throughout this year. So our plan for today will begin with about a half hour presentation from our key speaker, followed by a panel response with a few representatives from member organizations and partners. And then we will have about 10 minutes for Q&A at the end. The chat feature is disabled, but you can use it if you need to contact us for any technical issues. If and as you have questions that you'd like to see the panelists respond to or our presenter respond to, please use the Q&A feature. That is the question mark at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A. You can add questions in anonymously or with your name. We'll save those all toward the end and then go through them together um, in our Q&A session. Um, finally, this session is being recorded and the slides from the webinar will be shared with individuals after the webinar itself. So no need to take notes or screenshots. Finally, I just wanna thank the Wisconsin Council on Churches for hosting today's webinar and handling the IT for our session. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and introduce our speaker today. So thank you, Tony Langanall, for joining us. Tony Langanall is with Michael Best Strategies, where he advises on government relations, public policy, and public image matters. Before joining Michael Best, Tony was the Senior Vice President of Capital Consultants, a Madison-based government relations, public affairs, and advocacy firm. He was also the managing partner and co-founder of Capital Opinion, a public research firm and consultancy that combines cutting-edge techniques with political savvy. Previously, Tony served as special assistant to former Wisconsin governor, Tommy Thompson. In this role, Tony was Governor Thompson's traveling press and policy aide, among many other roles. He's worked on numerous campaigns in Wisconsin and beyond, including gubernatorial, congressional, legislative, issue-based, and judicial. Tony, did I get it all? Uh, and if so, I will turn over our slides to you for today. Thank you much uh, for joining us. It just means I'm really old. And we, we love that it brings the wisdom to the presentation today. Thank you so much. 
Awesome. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, excited uh, to share this this update. Um, I hope you find this to be a, a pretty agnostic uh, kind of review of the maps and kind of the legislative uh, political outlook. Um, we kind of take the tack that, you know, the maps are what the maps are, you know, not talking about how we got to where we are today, but the impact of, you know, the current maps that the legislature is going to run on in 2024. Um, I like to start out every presentation kind of with a cliff note. So in case you doze off, I get pretty data heavy on this presentation, but uh, with with the new maps, the the new lines, the the number of lawmakers that are either paired together or the number of open seats, plus lawmakers choosing to not seek re-election, -ele plus the elections themselves, we're you know expecting pretty historic uh, legislative turnover in 2024. Um, just looking at the maps, and we'll walk through this in more detail. You know, in the Senate, uh, Democrats can narrow the Republican majority in that House. But there's really not a path to the majority in 2024. It'll be in 2026 where that house will really be up for play, and that's something that Senator Hesselbein has, you know, given in her presentations on the new maps and and others. But um, that's where that house is at, and the state assembly will really be that control of that house will really be determined by 12 competitive seats, and we'll we'll take a look at at those seats. So moving along, just kind of want to set the framework for how we um, look at look at the maps. Um, various groups who've looked at the maps have done different analyses of the partisan lean. We did it pretty simple. We just took the, the top of the ticket in the last two elections, took an average of those and identified that partisan lean to the district. Others like the Daily Coast will go all the way back to 2016, aggregate all that data, uh, WIS politics just takes the 22 elections, and Joe Hendrick does another calculation on some races and goes back even to 2012. So this is just uh, a tool. Do not look at it as predictive at all. It's just a way to kind of identify the historic votes in those districts. Um, you know, a couple further disclaimers on the presentation. You know, past performance doesn't guarantee future results. Candidates really matter in races. It doesn't matter about the top of the ticket. Turnout and enthusiasm do play a role. And the only poll that matters, as you all know, is the election day poll. Um, we live in a very dynamic uh, political environment in the state. A lot of shifting geographies. Uh, back when Jeremy and I started in the Capitol, uh, you'd be hard pressed to find a Republican legislator north of Highway 29. Now you'd be hard pressed to find a Democratic lawmaker north of Highway 29. Similarly, in the last two, you know, in the gubernatorial elections, Waukesha used to be a pretty bellwether for Republicans on how that uh, the Republican candidate would do and would, you know, offset Dane County. That's shifted over the last 12 years. Um, so the environment in the state is constantly changing. So, you know, each election is its own election and, you know, can't judge too much on past behavior. Representative Bowen uh, is probably familiar with these two slides as well. These are the top two targets from both parties in the state assembly over many election cycles, and they continue to swim against the grain. Representative Novak has consistently represented a Democratic leaning district and outperformed the top of the ticket. So, as a you know, a hardworking Republican candidate in more of a Democratic area, he successfully has gotten reelected. And the same as uh, Representative Steve Doyle is a you know, in a Republican leaning district or in a 50 50 district, continues to outperform the top of the ticket as a Democrat and successfully reelected. So, you know, candidates do matter in when you compare to the top of the ticket results. If you listen to uh, Professor Franklin from Market University talk about his last poll last week, um, he was talking about enthusiasm a lot and how there's very depressed voter enthusiasm at this point, especially compared to the last presidential election cycle. A lot of time between now and election day, but you know, this graphic just shows how much that lack of enthusiasm could really impact turnout in an election. So we had two historically unpopular presidential candidates in 2016. That changed a little bit in 2020, plus other variables playing into that race. But you saw a 300,000 vote difference in between those two election cycles. We have very historically unpopular at this point presidential candidates again. You know, will that have an impact on turnout or will other variables such as war or other policy initiatives impact turnout? Too early to tell, but turnout 
turnout matters, voter intensity and interest matters. And again, there's a lot of time between now and election day, 193 days to go. Um, and again, that is the only poll that matters is on, on election day. So moving into the, the conversation about the maps directly with that as background and how we look at things. The map on the left was the map that the lawmakers ran on in 22 in the, in the state Senate. So Republicans currently have a super majority in the state Senate, 22 seats uh, to the 11 for the Democrats. If we take you know any of the analysis by either us on historic partisan lean or any of the other groups, everybody comes up with the new map that Governor Evers uh, submitted as a remedial map and the legislature signed, uh, passed and sent to his desk that under historic performance, Democrats would do well in 18 of the seats and Republicans would do well in, in 15. So that's the historic lean of those new Senate seats. In the state assembly, Republicans have a 64-35 majority. Under the new maps, you know, the historic performance of those districts, it'd be almost 50-50, 50, 50. 50 Republicans, 49. And this is pretty consistent under most groups' analysis of the new maps. The really disruptive thing that the um, the new maps do, and it's going to help create a lot of legislative turnover, is how the lines were drawn and how many pairs were both made in the Senate and the Assembly, and then uh, the number of open seats. So that is going to have a huge impact on the number of new lawmakers next session. So not just even the partisan makeup of the lines, but how the lines were drawn and how that pairs lawmakers and puts them in a position of whether or not they have to move as an incumbent to stay in office or run for office, or if that just creates another open seat. In the Senate, there are seven seats that are, there are six seats with seven lawmakers that were paired together, uh, seven open seats drawn under the new maps. In the assembly, there are 15 uh, assembly seats for their paired lawmakers and 15 seats that are open. So obviously since the maps were enacted, a lot of lawmakers have made decisions and numbers not as high as 44, but that was the potential when the maps were signed into law. At this point in the race now, um, April 15th was the first day uh, candidates could start taking out nomination papers to be on the ballot for the August primary. Those nomination papers are due by June 3rd. So we're in this period of time where lawmakers are now making their decisions, the incumbent lawmakers, on whether or not they're going to seek re-election, run for a different office, or move to a district and run for re-election. So far, we've heard from 22 lawmakers that they're not going to run for their current seat. So some of them are running for the Senate, some of them are running for other offices, like, um, and some are just retiring. But we we do know that there are 22 lawmakers for sure that are not coming back. Heard from another Republican who's going to make an announcement tomorrow. That'll get that number at least to 23 if there's not more announcements before the, the end of the week. They do have till June 3rd, so we expect this number to continue to grow. Here's where we are on retirements in comparison to previous election cycles. So we're at 22 now, expecting 23 tomorrow. Um, that's a pretty high watermark for this point in the process with nomination papers just getting pulled last week. Uh, we'll, we'll see that number continue to rise. May not be as high as 30 on retirements, but this is usually the biggest indicator of turnover is those self-selecting not to return to the legislature. If we put up there the number of lawmakers defeated, it's usually around high high mark. I think we saw was in 2010 was 10 lawmakers incumbents defeated. Every other year since then, I think the highest has ever been is five incumbents. So it's usually one or two, one last cycle that was an incumbent defeated. And usually in some years, it's, there's no incumbents defeated. So. Um, we're still going to see a lot of turnover, but probably that number around 40 at the end of the day of new lawmakers. So digging into the state Senate, um, as mentioned before, Republicans have a super majority in that House currently, 22 seats to the 10 for the Democrats with Senator Lena Taylor's seat uh, currently vacant. Um, can't. <laughs> These are the odd numbered seats in the, the state Senate, these lawmakers are not up this cycle. So state senators serve four-year terms. Half of the state Senate is elected uh, this cycle. Half is elected in 26. These odd-numbered lawmakers were uh, elected last go-round, so they don't have to face election. 
even though some of them were drawn into new districts, like Senator Markline was drawn into the 14th Senate district, he can still continue to represent the 17th district and will be able to do that until he has to run for reelection in 2026 and then would have to move before assuming office in January of 2027. Um, but this is the base of what will be returning next year. So Republicans will come back with at least 12, Democrats will come back with at least five. Here are the even numbered seats that are up. So there are 16 even numbered seats that are up this, this go round. Uh, these lawmakers are either uh, running for reelection or like Senator Rob Coles or Senator uh, Melissa Agard are not returning. So in order for Republicans to maintain the majority, they have 12 that are returning in January that don't have to run for reelection. They need to win five of these 16 seats that are up this cycle. For Democrats to get the majority, they start out with a base of five that are automatically going to get seated in January. They need to pick up 12 of the 16 seats to get to 17 to have control of that house. If we apply the analysis of where the districts lean or have historically performed, there's really five seats that are competitive, um, that are really in play where most of the energy and attention are going to be focused. Four of those are currently held by Republicans. One of them is currently held by a Democrat. And those are the ones that we're going to talk about a little bit. But if Democrats were to run the table and get all five of those competitive seats, they would still tap out at, at 15 seats. So Republicans would still return with an 1815 majority. And that's why we say there's really no path for the Democrats to take the Senate this cycle. And why they're talking about this is an incremental step for them, and they're really focusing on trying to get the majority in 2026. Now, looking at the, the competitive Senate races. So Senator Dewey Strobel re currently represents the 20th. Dan Canolo represents the 8th. Both are in relatively comfortable Republican seats. Senator Strobel is in a very comfortable Republican seat. They were both paired in the 8th Senate district, which Senator Canolo currently represents. Um, the little red markers kind of geographically represents where the lawmakers live. Uh, Senator Canole decided decide not to run for reelection. He's gonna run for the state assembly uh, in a Republican primary there. So Senator, uh, uh, Senator Strobel is gonna run in that seat. Um, he's already got an opponent, uh, Jody havish Sinekin, who ran against Canodal in the special election during the Supreme Court race uh, last spring. Um, this is a, a relatively uh, new district for Senator Strobel. So even though he represented the area, he only represented about 18% of this new district. So he has a lot of folks to um, introduce himself to. And as we can um, see with the historic performance of the top of the ticket, this is a pretty competitive seat and co comes in around 50% for each party. In the central part of the state, uh, Senator Joan Balwig in the 14th Senate District is up for election this cycle. The two odd numbered seats are not, but these three re Republican senators had relatively comfortable uh, Republican majorities in their seats. Under the new map, Senator Balwig got paired with Senator Jagler. So Senator Jagler represents the 13th District, continues to represent the 13th District, so he doesn't have to run for reelection. Even though Senator Balwig represents the 14th and lives in the 13th if she wants to continue to serve past uh january or in you know starting again in january she has to run for re-election in the 14th senator mark klein got drawn into the 14th so he currently resides there he can continue to represent the 17th until he has to face re-election in november of 2026. so senator balwig has announced that she's going to to move and going to run in the 14th Again, this is a, a new district for her. She only represented a third of this area, even though she represented the 14th previously. So she has to reintroduce herself to uh, the voters or introduce herself to two thirds of the voters in this district, um, even though she has the number. She's got two Democratic primary or two Democratic opponents that are gonna face each other in the primary, but this is about a 52% uh, Democratic leaning seat. So this is one of the very competitive seats that's gonna get a lot of attention. In the Fox Valley, uh, Senator Cabral Guevara, probably one of the biggest winners of any incumbent. She had a very competitive 51% seat. Senator Fine, also a, a good winner as far as like comfortableness in his seat. Um, and Senator Strobel, we're all kind of in this, this area. Uh, 
Senator Cabral Guevara went from a 51% seat to now representing a 65% seat. Senator Fine got moved out of the 18th Senate District and now is in the 20th, 20th Senate District. He's going to run for election in the 20th Senate District. He actually has a uh, primary by a former Republican uh, state rep, Tim Rantham. Um, but that leaves the 18th, which Fine currently represents as an open seat. Uh, this is one that the Democrats are going to target to, to pick up. Uh, it's now a 54% Democratic lean seat. Um, and there's a lot of interest in this in this seat with four candidates, two Republicans, two Democrats already uh, announced their their intentions to run there. The Green Bay uh, district is is really interesting too. You have three Republicans, state senators that represent that area in northeastern Wisconsin, all with uh, high performing Republican leaning seats. All three of them under the new maps got drawn into the 30th Senate district. So. Um, Senator Jacques, who represents the first, isn't up for re-election. He's actually running for Congress. He can continue to live where he lives in the 30th and represent the first if he's not elected to Congress until he has to uh, face voters. Senator Rob Coles and Senator Eric Wimberger both you know, looked at the makeup of the 30th Senate District and decided that they would rather uh, run in the second Senate District. And then Senator uh, Coles decided that he didn't want to do a Republican primary and opted to retire. So Senator Wimberger is running in the second, uh, leaving this as a, an open seat with no incumbent running for, for re-election. Uh, Jamie Wall, who was a member of Governor Doyle's cabinet, is, is running on the Democratic side. And the Alouez uh, City President Jim Rafter is running on the Republican side. But this is now you know a little more Democratic-leaning seat than it was previously under the, the new maps or the old maps. The only Democratic uh, currently held seat that is one of the competitive targets is uh, Senator Brad Paffs, the 32nd in La Crosse area. Um, it's at the upper end of the, the competitiveness at you know 53%. Um, Senator Paff was elected in 2020 by um, just 500 votes. He underperformed the top of the ticket uh, largely because he had a very well-known Republican opponent in that race, uh, but this race probably gets a little more uh, Democratic uh, with, if Senator Paff moves along with the top of the ticket, because the top of the ticket is a little better Democratic performing uh, than how Senator Paff did originally. So just ran through that pretty quick, but again, at the, at the high water mark, if Democrats won all those five competitive seats, that would still leave them two seats short of being able to take the majority in 2024. So the path for them, if they win at least, uh, uh, if they win uh, at least four of those seats, then that puts them in a position to, to win the majority in uh, 2026 if they pick up two of these seats. The fifth Senate district, which is currently represented by Senator Rob Hutton, the 21st Senate District, currently represented by Van Wangard, or the 17th, represented by Senator Howard Markline. Again, those are very competitive seats, but this is where the Democrats, if they, if you talk to them about, you know, what their path to the majority is, it's doing really well in 2024 and carrying every seat they can, and then having the option to go after these seats in, in 2026. If they don't get the number of seats that they're looking for in 2024, it makes running the table on these three th seats difficult and flipping control of the house in 2026 uh, difficult for them as well. Turning quickly to the state assembly, um, Republicans have a near super majority in that house, 64 to 35. Again, looking at the impact of the maps on, on the state assembly, you know, 15 districts uh, where uh, lawmakers are paired uh, 15 seats where there's no incumbent. Obviously, since then, I mean, we'll walk through this now. Uh, a lot of decisions have been made on those those open and paired seats. Um, Tom Mahalski, Robin Vining, a Republican and a Democrat, got paired together in the same seat. There's just going to be a general election. Um, Representative John Mako and Shea Sortwell got paired in the same seat. The, the second uh, Representative Mako decided he's not seeking re-election, so this is one of those pairs where they went different ways. Rather than primarying each other, Amy Binsfield and Paul Tittle, uh, Amy Binsfield is moving to a new district to run for election. 
This is one of the ones that hasn't been figured out yet. Ty Bodden and Representative Ron Tussler, uh, both are good friends with one another. Both are trying to still figure out which direction to go here, but that's still going to be uh, a minus one incumbent lawmaker unless they find a district for one of them to move into to run for reelection. Tyler August, the Assembly Majority Leader, got paired with freshman rep Amanda Nedweski. He just announced uh, this week that he is running in uh, the district that has the majority of his old seat, which is uh, the same district as Representative Ellen Shutt, another freshman Republican. So there is going to be a Republican primary there, um, which, again, will be another uh, plus or, mi or minus one Republican uh, incumbent. Elijah Benke, rather than primary David Steffen, moved to a new district. Um, both Representative Plummer and uh, William Penterman created a, an open seat by Representative Plummer not uh, running for re-election and Penterman moving to a new district. Representative Schra and Representative Gustafson are going to primary each other. So that, that'll that be another uh, minus one incumbent uh, lawmaker scenario. And then Representative Edmund decided not to run for re-election versus primary uh, uh, Representative uh, Summerfield. Uh, Bob Donovan, Dan Reamer, a Republican and a Democrat. Uh, Rob uh, Bob Donovan moved to a new district. This one's actually kind of funny. He uh, in moving to a new district. He is moving into the same district where his uh, previous opponent. So uh, a, a rematch with his opponent from 22 in a new district number. This is the only Democratic pairing on the um, that happened as of the new maps. Representative Mike Bear and Alex Jores. Uh, Representative Jores uh, moved to a new district rather than the two freshman Democratic reps uh, primarying each other. And finally, Re Nick Redinger announced this week that he is not uh, primarying Rep. Chuck Wagers. Um, there really are 15 that were paired. <laughs> Tired. Uh, Rep. Rosar and Rep. Spiros have uh, announced that they are going to primary one another and whoever wins, wins. So that's another minus one incumbent. And then Representative you know, jumped down to uh, Cindy Duca and Scott Johnson. Scott Johnson's moving to a, a new district. So a lot of decisions, not a lot that are still out out hanging, but yeah, having the the pairing did have a significant impact on the number of lawmakers seeking re-election. If you talk to the two caucuses, so if you talk to the Republican Assembly Campaign Committee or you talk to the Assembly Democratic Campaign Committee, they'll put the number of competitive seats somewhere in the the 12 to, to nine range of seats that they're targeting. Um, these these are the races that will determine the majority. If, you know, if the Republicans, um, you know, if there are 46 seats that, you know, the Republicans have identified as, you know, as safe seats, um, actually Robin Voss says the number's a little higher, so we're a little conservative on 46. Um, they need to win for these competitive seats to uh, maintain the majority. For the Democrats to get the majority, they need to win nine of these 12 competitive seats. And that, you know, depending on who you talk to, that number fluctuates a little bit, but these, this is the area where the most are going to, where most of the attention is going to be spent. The interesting thing on the, the most competitive seats are five of them, or six of them rather, are uh, open seats. Um, where there's no power of incumbency. So those those seats even become more hyper competitive uh, because there's not an incumbent. And that's where there's a lot of effort right now is to maybe, and you're probably hearing out there, former lawmakers coming back and considering running for office. We've heard of a couple former Democratic lawmakers that have signed up to run in some competitive seats. And we're hearing some Republic, former Republican lawmakers, people that aren't incumbents now, but have incumbent name ID because with these open seats, no power of incumbency, um, a lot of people having to introduce themselves to voters makes them even more competitive and more of a toss up. Here is the, you know, that group of competitive seats geographically, just so folks can get a picture of where most of these races are. Um, just spending, you know, just a brief amount of time. We talked about Doyle and Novak in the Southwest corner there in La Crosse and in Dodgeville. Uh, Representative Shannon Zimmerman, member of the Finance Committee, went from a you know, almost 60% Republican seat to a 50-50 under the new map. Uh, Representative uh, Clint Moses, also close to 60% under the old map, is in a 51% in a district. Um, the incumbents are the ones on this 
the screen that you know have the highest uh, chance of returning. You know, they're the least least competitive just because they have their known quantities. These open seats that are spread around are those those are the ones where a significant amount of effort is being placed in candidate recruiting and trying to get former lawmakers or well known people in those areas to run to help with the the name ID. <clears throat> so just kind of in in summary, um, you know there. We're, we're expecting for those of us that work in the Capitol, those of you that do grassroots advocacy, there's going to be a lot of turnover this cycle just because of the disruption of the new maps, retirements, uh, and then, you know, some election term turnover come November. So a lot of new faces to get to know, a lot of new faces to educate. Um, the Democrats on the Senate side, you know, have a, an opportunity to make a dent in the Republican majority but it really is a two election cycle uh, chance for them to flip that house. And for control of the state assembly, it's really gonna come down to those 12 competitive seats and you know who can get the best candidates and people to turn out on, on election day. And with that, turn it over to Rochelle. Thank you so much, Tony. I do see a few questions in the chat that I think are most appropriate for you that I'll, I'll have you field first and then we can go to our panelists for a response. So um, you mentioned that Andre Jacques, um, current Senator is running for Congress. Can he hold his Senate seat or does he have to give that up while he runs or um, how does that work? He can he can run as an incumbent Senator, um, but then when he gets sworn in, he'd have to give up his seat before being sworn into Congress. So he's really not running a, a big risk if he loses that seat, is that correct? This is yeah, this is every lawmaker's dream is a free shot at another office. Thanks for clarifying that. And then just uh, right at the beginning of your presentation, um, you had noted some of the turnover statistics, Tony. Historically, is 2016 the lowest number of lawmakers not seeking re-election? Um, to look back at the slides for those statistics. No, that was the lowest number of retirees. Retirees. So there was a lot of in, consistency in that cycle. Yes. Yeah. Not a lot of people decided not to seek re-election. Right. A lot of people, this, to note double negatives, yes. there weren't any people choosing not to, there weren't a lot of retirees. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tony. We could have uh, gone down that uh cycle a few different times differently. Oh, um, wonderful. Well, Tony, we'll ask you to stay on as we get into the discussion with our panelists here, but thank you so much for sharing that information. I know it really is an overwhelming amount of data, but all we're doing here is trying to set the, the context for these discussions and really help each of you as individuals who are, are advocates or doing grassroots work or engaging at any level with policymakers know the context that the, these individuals are working in and perhaps some of the trade-offs that they're thinking about and what that environment is like at the state level going into this election season. So with that, I will um, just introduce our panelists here. We have Jeremy Levin with the Rural Wisconsin Health Cooperative, Carlene Beckin with the Fair Maps Coalition, and David Bowen with AARP. So I'll ask each of you um, if you have any key takeaways from Tony's presentation or something that surprised you or an item that you really want um, panelists to focus on. So I'll start with Jeremy and then go to Carlene followed by David. Thank you. Well, well, first I wanna thank Tony for just a great presentation, also insinuating that I'm very old and have been at this way too long. So thanks, Tony. Um, you know, he did a great job. I think what we are seeing is um, in these new maps is we're going to have obviously a very different legislature and uh, much closer numbers. And so how that then changes the way that uh, laws are made, policies done, how people um, potentially may engage more, both from um, advocates' roles and also uh, on committee structure. I mean, it has a lot of different um, effects and ramifications, but I, we will definitely see closer closer numbers and not something that we've seen for um, 15 years, so. Thank you, Jeremy. We'll go to you, Carlene. 
Yes, thank you, Tony, for that. And uh, it was, I I live in this world of maps as uh, the organizer for the Fair Maps Coalition and having it put there in in graphic form was very helpful to me personally. And I will just echo what Jeremy said. I think uh, the thing that we at the Fair Maps Coalition really are advocating for at a grassroots level and uh, organizational level is for a more representative and accountable state legislature. And that happens when you have these districts that are highly competitive where, um, where candidates aren't assured election. And so they really have to be responsive to their constituents. And so I, uh, you know, and that happens on both ends of the spectrum. It doesn't matter which party you're with. If, if you are, if your base is solidly 70, 30 or 60, 40, even what does it matter? You're going to be reelected because people do really pay attention to the letter after the after your name. And so what I'm looking forward to is um, a more collaborative state legislature, one that will pass, you know, legislation that constituents are asking for and look for for common ground to be able to get those things through. And I think that benefits all of us. Thank you. And David, what are your takeaways here? What should advocates know? Absolutely. Um, thank you so much for the invitation and really appreciate Tony for that breakdown. Um, my first time being able to see it in that way where you can literally look at the state and see all these dynamics that are happening at the same time. Um, I think one of the things that advocates should be able to look for is a, a new ability to have conversations on some of the most pressing issues um, that before likely did not get the time of day, before did not get that amount of attention. And uh, we at AARP are working hard when it comes to trying to find common ground, bipartisan uh, issues and solutions. And uh, we see a clearer path to be able to do that um, when it comes to caregiving, when it comes to uh, utilities and saving dollars for consumers, when it comes to uh, a new conversation on affordable health care. Uh, these are things that are very pressing, affecting aging and retired Wisconsinites all over the state. And we believe that this will, uh, the competition is a good thing. Uh, the ability to have more balanced districts uh, where there is a new conversation that we can have. Thank you. And I'll remind folks, if you'd like to um, have our uh, panelists respond to questions or see anything Tony addressed, please do use the Q&A feature. Um, I was struck in particular, uh, Tony mentioned that there was a previous seat that was won only by 500 votes, and it's a reminder of how tight some of these margins are. I think we uh, sometimes forget how narrow um, that can be at a state legislative district level. You know, we often hear about local races. There was one in my community this uh, this cycle for a county, a local race that was lost by five votes. And that's that's kind of the local level, but 500 votes, you know, that's a few precincts and um, really possible to move the needle on some of those close districts. Um, I did see a question in the chat um, specifically about the maps and the situation in which some senators will be able to continue representing districts. Um, under the new lines, even if they live outside of them because they're not hitting the next election cycle. And Carlene responded to that. Uh, there was also a um, some interest in this issue by the Supreme Court. Um, Carlene, did you wanna expand on that anymore at this point? Yeah, I can actually say a little bit about that. The Supreme Court in their December 22nd decision uh, decided not to have all the senators be up for re-election, even though that was the request of three of the petitioners um, because they were just elected in 2022 and they felt like it would be, it would really cause some, some chaos. Um, and I happen to live, I, I lived before in the 15th, Senate district, and now I live in the 17th. And uh, so uh, Howard Markline is one of the state senators who was drawn out of, a out of the 17th Senate district, but he will continue to represent the 17th. He may choose to move into the, seven into the new 17th um, before the 2026 election. He may choose to run, run and move in if he wins. 
Um, but it, he he will continue to be the representative until 2026. And so I, you know, I, I think that the court's rationale and what they stated was that they just felt like it would cause too much confusion. Um, so that that's what they decided to do. You're, you're muted, Rochelle. Thank you. Um, great question in the chat. I'll go to that. And then David, I see that you have one for Tony too. So we'll go to you next. But um, someone has asked with these changes in the maps, are there particular issues that you think, not necessarily that your group is working on, but perennial issues that have been coming up that maybe will get a new look or new life? Are there any topics that you're thinking the legislature may either talk about differently or do something differently on anything coming up. And I'll just open that up to any of our panelists to weigh in on. Yeah, I can go first and just highlight um, a number of the solutions around, um, especially around care. So uh, if you paid attention to the legislature this time around, healthy aging grants, for, uh, for instance, passed both houses, but did not pass uh, the floor. Um, was not uh, passed on, um, in the Senate. Uh, a number of bills ended up dying that way where it, it could only get uh, only so far and then stall right at the end. Um, a, a number of conversations around broadband funding and uh, the caregiver tax credit that were conversations in the in the budget. Um, a lot, a number of them that were that that had bipartisan support, but still uh, could not get to the finish line. So I think you'll have a number of issues um, that had some movement, had some momentum, and they will have a better chance at, at passing this time. David, would you put Medicaid expansion on that list? Someone asked about it in the chat, and I think it's a topic that a lot of people are interested in or or want to see how that fits into any new narratives what do you think on that one david and and we'll see if others have thoughts on that in particular too very good question and uh, uh we at arp we're very interested in seeing if uh the stars align to have a new conversation on medicaid expansion and what it could do for our state if we cover an additional uh 74 000 people if we open up the the market to 241,000 eligible people, $1.6 billion that would funnel into our state and federal funding. Um, th these are a lot of the impacts that could be made, um, but it, it's also very clear from Tony's presentation that some of the stark uh, incumbents in the legislature, uh, for instance, uh, Speaker Voss has not been a fan of uh, Medicaid expansion. So. It would be interesting to see what the legislature looks like, and uh, if there's a new balance in conversation. Uh, we, we saw the Assembly Republicans have a proposal around uh, marijuana, uh, uh, not legalization, but I believe it was uh, for, for medical uh, cannabis medical, use, right? For medical marijuana. So it, it, it's a, it, it's a, there's a unique dynamic that is happening where you see small changes and small increments. And uh, I, I think it will only continue to grow in the next, le next legislature, but it depends on how much. Jeremy, have anything to weigh in on, on that issue in particular? Well, I, I agree. I think um, it's some wait and see. Uh, I think there were some in the advocate community that thought uh, once uh, um, former Governor Walker was out of office that Medicaid expansion might move, but then obviously there was uh, definite resistance from um, the assembly. Uh, I, you know, so I mean, it does still matter in terms of who might be uh, the leaders. Um, I, I think it's also important to remind, even as I think now nationally, we're down to only 11 states that haven't expanded. Um, Wisconsin is the only state that doesn't have a gap in insurance. So anyone who isn't eligible for Medicaid can be in the marketplace. Um, so I, I think that also puts us in a very different position, um, maybe not as clear cut. Uh, I think there are some bills that might uh, have better chances as we get to closer 
uh, numbers. Um, I think both the last couple of sessions, there were sort of more rules or thoughts that if you couldn't agree in the caucus of the majority party and couldn't get you know, a majority support within the majority, then something wouldn't move. Well, now those numbers are going to be closer and less. And so how does that affect um, some of those policies that might not have reached the finish line? Yeah, I agree with both my co-panelists about things reaching the finish line that might not have before. I think that there's the possibility for more pushback um, on some of those things that maybe leadership had had um, not wanted to see come to a vote before. I'm a retired public educator. I would very much like to see something happen. Uh, and I think it has the possibility with public education funding. There was a blue ribbon bipartisan commission that made recommendations and those have not been implemented. And I know that, know that there are legislators on both sides of the aisle that are very frustrated about that. Um, and I also see uh, gun, gun violence prevent prevention legislation um, having some possibilities, uh, especially, I, I think that those two things in particular can invigorate younger voters because they see some discrepancies there that they're not happy about. Um, I also serve on the village board in my little village and it, the share revenue uh, is something that, that, that local governments, whether they are in Blue counties or or red counties all agree that municipal and county governments are not being funded at the at the level that we need, and so it's a broken system. And I see possibilities for that system and that funding formula for both public education and for shared revenue to to maybe get some bipartisan work that uh, could change those and really make a difference for local communities and local schools. Thank you. Um, David, let me go back to you. Um, I believe you had a question for Tony. Sure. I, I, I'm always a student of history, and uh, uh, I, I appreciate uh, Tony's uh, history in the state capitol. Let's compare 2020, now 24's new map uh, installation to 2012's and 2002's. What differences do you see? What similarities? So when you when you look up at the the number of retirees, every cycle following a redistricting is the biggest bump in new lawmakers. So uh, <clears throat> redistricting is always disruptive to the incumbents in the capital. So that's when we always see our biggest influx of of new law lawmakers. So that we're doing this two cycles in a row is just you know a lot of turnover two cycles in a row. But you know, historically, every election cycle following a, a new map, we get a lot of retirees and a lot of folks that don't want to run in new districts. And Tony, maybe I'll stick with you for this one. A uh, question from an attendee. How will the new maps affect current leadership in each chamber? So, you know, every chamber elects, you know, the person who's um, you know, at the tiller for for that house and that caucus, but how might this change? Who ends up in leadership or the perhaps the way leadership operates? Yeah, so in the in the Senate, um, so I, I think on the Republican side, we'll start with that. Um, in the Senate, neither Senator, Senate Majority Leader Devin Lemahieu or Senate President Chris Kapinga are up this cycle. So those two um, rely on their caucus vote, their caucus dynamic, depending on how the elections go, depending on those competitive seats and who comes back you know, could have a different caucus dynamic and they vote right the week after the election on their new leadership. And depending who's elected and what kind of part of the party they represent, um, you know, that'll have a dynamic on, on the caucus leadership. On the assembly Republican side, um, both, you know, the two top Republicans in the assembly have primaries. Um, I mean, I wouldn't bet against either of them in their primaries. I mean, I, it's, I bet that, you know, both Speaker Voss and Majority Leader August come back next session, but, you know, the elections in the assembly matter because that's who's the available candidate. So 
Uh, and I think it's the same for the Democrats as well. It's, you know, the caucus dynamics are a little different in, in both houses. If the Democrats make progress in, in each house, I'm sure they're going to reward their leadership that got them either the majority in the assembly or closer to the majority in the Senate that they're headed in the right direction. And that's the right leadership team. Um, but it really depends on who the caucus is post-election day on who the new leadership will be. Tell you another great question from the chat. Um, obviously, these new maps are for state legislative districts. Are there any impl implications from having these new state legislative districts for statewide races or congressional races? Any um, components there that we should be thinking about in terms of either turnout or candidate quality and how that plays in? There's there's definitely a, a school of thought that the quality of the candidates at the lower part of the ticket help build up the top of the ticket. So if you have folks that are more invested in their local ticket, especially when you have candidates that you're not as quite as interested in or invested in at the top of the ticket, it it does help uh, with those competitive races. So you know competitive legislative races could have upward effect on the ticket. Um, and as we talked about, the reverse could happen to the top of the ticket could depress turnout, you know, impacting legislative races and other races. This has been sort of an interesting thought for me to wrap my mind, or my mind around, because usually the top of the ticket draws out voters. People are excited to vote for president. But it seems like this year with that, those enthusiasm gaps that you noted, there's sort of the opposite effect happening where perhaps and and I think we've seen this in some of the congressional races, too, that are recruiting candidates to run who otherwise maybe would not have been that interested, candidates are being recruited to make sure that people come out to vote and pull up the top of the ticket um, from those more local or regional candidates as well. A little bit of a unique dynamic this year. Yeah, um, I, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Really. Um, There was a comment made earlier and I just wanted to kind of respond to it about we're gonna have to wait and see who these folks are before we start to, to you know, lobby them or, or think about how we want to talk to them. And I would just say we want to start way before that. We want to be at all their listing sessions or in all their town halls and be asking those questions about our our issues as we move forward to see where they stand, not only for for ourselves, but for our constituencies. And uh, I, I can tell you that for the Fair Maps Coalition, we are going to be asking, do you support an independent nonpartisan redistricting process? because we see that so much money and time and energy has been spent on, on court cases dating back to 1981. 1971 was the last time. I'm sure Tony could, I've done these presentations, a whole bunch about the history, not necessarily about where the balances were, but certainly 1971 was the last time that our maps did not go to court. Um, and so that's a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of energy that's been spent on that and we just need to be able to fix that. And so I would advocate for anybody who cares about an issue being at any of any listening session or event where you have an opportunity to ask candidates questions about where they stand on the issues that you care about because you want those people that are gonna support your issues to make it through the primary. I do see one more question in the Q&A, and then I'm going to um, pose that here and then ask each of our panelists to just wrap up with a final thought on how advocates should be engaging in 2024. What do you recommend people do, to Carlene's point? Um, but there have been a lot of demographic changes in the state. We have a rapidly aging population. We have in-migration to a few particular counties and out-migration from others. Um, you know, Dane County and Eau Claire are, are growing rapidly with um, a lot of aging residents and a lot of rural, rural areas in the state. Um, for, for any of our panelists, um, how do you see any of these demographic changes playing into uh, district competitiveness or candidate competitiveness or the types of conversations? Where do those demographics come into the equation? Any thoughts on that? I guess I can start. I mean, I think when you get into Dane County, it's sort of younger and growing and it's been blue for a while. So there it's really the turnout game and that really affects a lot more on the 
statewide races, and that's why you see the campaigns pushing and coming in. Um, interestingly, you know, one of the uh, seats that Tony reviewed was the 30th, um, which is Representative uh, Zimmerman, and that's really become much more of almost like a suburban uh, Twin Cities. So I think that's not saying that, it, I mean, and obviously it's 50-50, um, it just may be potentially different issues at play and, um, you know, people maybe who are newer to the area. So uh, it, you know, it just means sort of those issues that um, drive some of the conversation. Um, I think, you know, overall, uh, yeah, Wisconsin definitely is an aging state. Um, so they're, as candidates go out and talk to their communities, um, it, it, it's, you know, talking about the issues that uh, people want to talk about. And so the more competitive a district is, the more you're talking about those issues, maybe not just such your, your partisan issues. So um, uh, yeah, I, as Carlene was talking about, it's, it's engagement and you do it as early and often as you can. Jeremy, are there any other um, tips when you're talking to folks from um, rural hospitals that are, are mobilizing or engaging um, this year? Um, what are you encouraging folks to do? Just, I, I think engagement's always there, you know, listen to what's being talked about, um, you know, try and reach out. I mean, we always tell our members to, to reach out to their local electeds and they can do that too while they're running. And I think most of our uh, members are quite engaged into their communities. So they're oftentimes sought out as well. I think that's a great reminder that, you know, many of these individuals who are either current policymakers or running for office you know, maybe they have a particular area of expertise, but they are masters of none. So the issue that you care very, very much about as an advocate may not even be on their radar. So really making sure that they're, you're educating folks on what the issues are, um, bringing those personal stories to lawmakers is extremely powerful. Um, Carlene, I'll go to you on any other um, key information you think uh, voters or advocates should be aware of. Uh, you read my mind, educating candidates about what the issues are that folks care about. And really, I think emphasizing shared values that we have across the state. Um, there's been a lot of emphasis that's been put on the urban rural divide and on racial divides and, and other kinds of things. But when it comes right down to it, we all really want the same things. We want a healthy environment for our you know, clean air and water. We want quality public education. We want to be safe in our neighborhoods. And that doesn't matter where we live. And so whatever we can do to emphasize the shared values and how we can get there together and, and minimize the, the divides and really help people see, see one another um, in, in all settings, I think is, is, uh, is good for our politics at large. And, um, uh, I hope people will lean into that and and away from looking for things that divide us because throwing rocks is not getting us very far. A lot of broken windows. Thank you. And uh, David, I will welcome the last word on that from you when you're talking with advocates. What do you want to emphasize? Sure. Um, I agree with both of my co-panelists. Um, it, it's really important to build relationships and to have direct conversations. Um, not being afraid of the DRR that is on their name, um, but being more uh, cognizant of the fact that these issues affect all Wisconsinites. And uh, if we don't find uh, that common ground, there's no way that we could help uh, those who need that support. Um, so for caregivers, where there's nearly 600,000 of them around the state providing free labor, taking care of their loved ones, they need uh, the financial support. They need the instructions from hospitals on how to take care of their loved ones. These things change with state legislation and being able to have conversations on, like Carlene is saying, new issues um, that I say have not been tainted yet uh, is really important because uh, you can have a, a more balanced conversation and, and really bring it home to the fact that uh, our destinies are tied and uh, the folks that are doing really important work, especially in our state, uh, for folks that are um, vulnerable, 
um, they need that help right now. And uh, we're having some success, uh, even at the congressional level, trying to connect with the entire Wisconsin delegation. We will be replicating that at the state level too and build on to some of the successes that we've had last session. Well said, thank you to each of our panelists and especially to Tony Lincoln with Michael Best for joining us today. Um, we will send a follow-up email with the slides from this presentation as well as some resources, making sure that you can actually look up where your home is under these new maps. You can also make sure that you can check your current legislator and have some other resources. Um, especially thank you to Wisconsin Partners for hosting and facilitating today and for your engagement with each of our member organizations. Please, um, if you were invited through this webinar from someone like me or Jeremy or David um, or someone who's not on the call today, circle back with that organization because they are mobilizing um, on various issues and engaging with lawmakers and candidates throughout this election season. And this is the best time to get your issues in front of people when they are learning a lot about their community. So thank you so much for joining us and we will look forward to connecting again. Thank you.